conscripted at the age of six. Candidates 029 and 043 were inherently superlative children, not necessarily in character, but in their biological and mental composition, they stood out in the eyes of Dr. Catherine Halsey. Both of them were subjected to rigorous, comprehensive training and indoctrination from 2517 to 2525 to prepare them for their service to the UNSC as Spartan II super soldiers. They underwent the dangerous augmentations of Project Aster and survived, being fortunate enough to have their bodies successfully enhanced for use with Mjolnir powered armor. Joshua 029 was the designated leader of an iteration of Gold Team in 2526, including Naomi 010, Daisy 023, and possibly, but not certainly, Anton 044. These Spartans were assigned to an infiltration operation targeting a Covenant frigate, which took place over the planet Netherop in March of 26. They, alongside two other Spartan teams, successfully boarded the vessel. Once inside, Joshua and his team retrieved materiel and enemy bodies for study by the Office of Naval Intelligence. Using banshees as makeshift containers, these prizes were sent out of the ship's hangar to drift in space for later collection. Unfortunately, their primary objective went awry when the frigate's shipmaster activated a delayed self-destruct sequence, forcing all 12 Spartans to evacuate the ship before it detonated. With Joshua still leading Gold Team, the same 12 Spartans were then assigned to the newly conceived Operation Silent Storm, a mission both flexible in application and devastating in effect. These Spartan teams, under the mentoring of Staff Sergeant Avery Johnson, and in collaboration with the feared Black Dagger's ODST Battalion, were ordered to find ways of inserting and detonating nuclear warheads within capital vessels of the Covenant Navy's invasion fleet. Their first assignment was to visit the Baiko planetary system and await the inevitable Covenant arrival, since Baiko was anticipated to be in the warpath of the alien hegemony due to its strategic location. The Prowler Group, designated Task Force Yama, carried the operatives of Silent Storm to one of Baiko's moons, the icy sphere of Seba. Unfortunately for the UNSC, a group of insurrectionists had taken up residence in the abandoned ice quarry that the Black Daggers and Spartans had intended to use for themselves. After a confused and for the ODST's casualty-heavy drop into a storm of gunfire, they managed to rally on the surface for an effective assault on the insurrectionist fortifications. By the aftermath of the battle, the task force's operatives possessed upwards of 300 rebel prisoners. When the Covenant arrived and the prisoners needed to be evacuated, John 117 spotted a known leader in the United Rebel Front, General Harper Garvin. His efforts to detain the general specifically were questioned by Joshua. John answered him and simultaneously explained to the other Spartans that he had found a target worth securing for the Office of Naval Intelligence. Nevertheless, they ran out of time when the Covenant descended on Seba and shot down one of their escaping prowlers, the Starry Knight. John ordered the insurrectionists to rapidly board their Banta-class transport and then led all three Spartan teams on an improvised rescue operation. As before, it was Joshua who spoke first to ask John his plan for salvaging an increasingly disastrous exit from the Ice Moon. Together, the Spartans descended into a flurry of ice and plasma to rescue any survivors of the crash and, if need be, deny the Covenant a Prowler and its database. They found that not only had the Starry Knight crashed into one of the quarry boundaries and sat partially buried in an avalanche, but also the Covenant were deploying forces to salvage the ship. Their mission objective promptly changed to asset denial. Joshua was noticeably pleased with this. They managed to bring the Starry Knight down to the quarry floor by triggering another avalanche with M301 grenade launchers. Although this technique came at the expense of injuring or temporarily immobilizing six of the 12 Spartans, including John 117, they nevertheless managed to reach the Starry Knight rescue Sergeant Johnson and four Black Dagger ODSTs, and obliterate the stealth vessel using its onboard Fury-class tactical nuke. John's armor was compromised during the battle with the Covenant recovery team, but Joshua had a patching kit on hand, keeping Sierra 117 from suffocating in the moon's thin atmosphere. Their next mission was discreetly undertaken at the behest of the Black Dagger's Colonel Crowther, who wanted to keep them away from a man whom he suspected of being a traitor. The acting commander of Task Force Yama 
Hector Nieto. Their objective was stationed in orbit above the recently glassed planet Edelin. Joshua and Gold Team, alongside Green Team, deployed in a squadron of base lard interceptors and fought their way through Banshees and Seraphs to reach the Covenant logistics vessels that were their targets. The Spartans staged the destruction of their base lards and used personal thruster packs to deliver Havoc tactical nukes to four of the enemy ships, then distanced themselves from the resulting detonations. They were picked up by a pair of Prowlers, which created a lucky distraction for John and Blue Team to deliver their Havocs to a trio of Covenant munitions carriers. The final explosive raid carried out under Silent Storm occurred on and around the planet Naraka, home to a group of ancient Forerunner cities and a giant logistics support ring for the Covenant fleet. Although Spartan teams Green and Blue reached the surface of Naraka and fought their way onto the ring, the Prowlers carrying Joshua and Gold Team were forced to abort their insertion runs. Although they had no further active role in Operation Silent Storm, Joshua and the other Spartans would go on to fight in multiple campaigns and theaters of war throughout the Human Covenant conflict. One notable operation took place in 2552 on the planet Sigma Octanus IV, in the city of Cote d'Azur. The Covenant were occupying the city and brutalizing the surrounding regions, refusing to destroy the planet with orbital bombardment for then unknown purposes. The Spartans were deployed to neutralize the Covenant's ground forces. Twenty civilian survivors were discovered by Red Team during the infiltration of Cote d'Azur. Joshua 029 was Red Team leader for this operation. He and his team safely evacuated the civilians with no casualties. In that same year, Joshua and the other Spartan twos were assigned to Operation Red Flag, a desperate mission to capture a Covenant prophet, which the Office of Naval Intelligence hoped would force a stalemate with humanity's mortal enemy. Unfortunately, the Covenant had already discovered Reach, and the apex of their invasion occurred on the day that the Spartan II commandos were meant to leave Reach for Red Flag. With the exception of three, all of the Spartans aboard the Pillar of Autumn were then assigned to Red Team by the Master Chief, who designated Fred 104 as Red Leader. Fred designated Kelly 087 as Red 2, and Joshua 029 as Red 3. Their new mission was to defend the ground-based power station for the planet's orbital defense cannons. Red Team was sent back into Reach's atmosphere inside a single Pelican dropship, and their situation became dire. Their pilot, a man named Mitchell, was killed by plasma fire from a Seraph squadron. It was Joshua who confirmed his death and promptly set to work trying to see if the flight controls could be salvaged from an interface in the passenger bay. Unfortunately for them all, the only functional controls were for their dropship's thrusters. On Fred's orders, the Spartans scrambled to jump from the disintegrating Pelican. Nevertheless, while they avoided sharing the doom of the crashing dropship, four of the 22 Mjolnir-clad warriors were killed, presumably on impact with Reach's surface. Six were wounded with varying levels of injury, and the rest remained in mostly full fighting condition, including Fred, Kelly, and Joshua. On Fred's orders, Joshua had retrieved a topographical map of the region and satellite imagery from Cortana before they left the Pillar of Autumn. Using this data, they traveled to the Mac Generator Complex and found devastation. The generators hadn't fallen, but a ragged squad of marines was all that had survived a rash, lethal UNSC airstrike that killed Covenant and human forces alike. Worse still, Joshua discovered a Covenant invasion force mustering in the next valley over. Fred devised a plan to use three banshees recovered from the initial battle. They would fly Fury tactical nukes into the gravity lift of the nearby Covenant warship. A detonation from within the cruiser would destroy the Covenant forces while protecting the adjacent Supermac generators from electromagnetic radiation. The plan worked. Kelly successfully delivered the payload into the gravity lift, but Joshua's Banshee was struck by plasma fire from the warship's cannons. He was subsequently listed as missing in action. William 043 was also a member of Operation Red Flag, and was one of the Spartans wounded on impact with Reach's surface, suffering a cracked tibia in one leg and internal bleeding. 
Designated Red 12 and the leader of Team Delta by Fred, he was ordered to go with the other five injured Spartans, as well as the four Marine survivors, to establish a fallback point at the entrance to a series of underground tunnels belonging to the Office of Naval Intelligence. Fred 104 received rescue orders from a Vice Admiral hiding southeast of the UNSC's HICOM facility, and subsequently divided the members of Red Team among four different objectives. William was successful in reaching the fallback location alongside Spartans Isaac 039 and Vin 030, but at some point along the way, they were separated from the other seven members of their group. Their fate remains unknown. Will reunited with Kelly and Fred at what remained of the underground Oni site's surface entrance, the latter two having just used wraith tanks to bulldoze through encroaching Covenant excavation forces. They used a steel cable to descend the shaft into the facility, and met with Isaac and Vin guarding the passage at the bottom. Will's team had been attempting to access the door that stood between them and the interior of the Oni site. All but one of its interfaces were non-functional. It only occurred to Kelly to use a specific code with the remaining option. She whistled, Ollie Ollie Oxen Free, into the voice channel, and the Spartans waited for two minutes. Although Fred started to consider other options, the door opened to reveal Dr. Catherine Halsey waiting on the other side. She greeted each one of them, and they went deeper into the Oni site, where Dr. Halsey began preparing medical treatment for serious injuries sustained by Kelly. At the same time, she directed Fred and Will to retrieve Mark V Mjolnir upgrades, weaponry, and ammunition from material lockers. The Covenant, however, were already close to breaching the underground facility. Their excavation efforts injured Dr. Halsey in her office, but not seriously enough to keep her from initiating an explosive purge of the site. She gave herself, Will, and the others three minutes to evacuate and reach the titanium mine still deeper inside Menachite Mountain. Spartan 043 also witnessed the orders given by Halsey for the artificial intelligence Kalmia to self-terminate. Will carried the ammunition, supplies, and armor components with him as they fled the facility, and was the one who guarded Dr. Halsey during an unsuccessful ambush from Covenant stealth elites. The Spartans fended them off, and then Will also carried Dr. Halsey for the group's descent 500 meters into the roots of the mountain. In the excavated tunnels and connected caverns, the Spartans and Dr. Halsey spent eight days searching for a path to the surface, and for the latter, a hunch. Their time was spent on almost mundane activities. They worked, they rested, they slept, and they waited. Meanwhile, William and the others learned the word game Simple Cipher and 20 Questions, and perhaps a few others from Halsey. Will specifically was also given an experimental upgrade for his heads-up display's target acquisition. It was Fred, however, who stumbled upon a Forerunner artifact while Dr. Halsey was preparing an upgrade for him. He activated a series of symbols set into the rock of the cavern walls, which became increasingly elaborate and beautiful, eventually leading his team into a vast underground chamber from which they retrieved a Forerunner slipspace crystal. The Covenant forces above pinpointed their location thanks to a burst of radiation from the crystal, and they promptly used a high-intensity plasma beam to cut through the chamber ceiling, forcing the Spartans to retreat with Halsey into a connected passageway. Vin and Isaac went missing and were most likely killed in an attempt to delay the invading foot soldiers, and the rest of them were trapped by a dead end. Will and his team remained trapped only for a short time, however. A group of survivors from Alpha Halo and the Surface of Reach came to their rescue at the behest of Vice Admiral Danforth Whitcomb. Together, they subsequently found themselves surrounded by innumerable Covenant warriors who had filled large balconies built into the chamber's circumference. Yet the Covenant would not risk damaging the slipspace crystal, so they descended to the ground floor to take the Forerunner artifact in close quarters combat. The human survivors, however, capitalized on their enemies refrained from shooting and escaped in the rescue party's captured spirit dropship. They successfully evacuated Reach's surface and rendezvoused with perhaps the most bizarre and glorious method of space travel seen during the human covenant conflict, the Gettysburg Ascendant Justice Hybrid. A child of Cortana's genius, this duality of a battleship fled into slipspace with William and the others, straight into an unforeseen complication.
Not even Dr. Halsey actually knew what the slipspace crystal's intended purpose was, let alone how to implement it. The crystal drastically altered their journey through subspace. Covenant warships had followed Gettysburg Ascendant Justice into this new dimension, and attempted to use their plasma weaponry against it, only to have the plasma smear, sputter, go left or right, anywhere but the intended target. Entities without enough mass were distorted, seemingly teleported, or otherwise randomly dispersed in this not slipspace. While the human survivors from Alpha Halo and Reach attempted to figure out how to deal with their situation, survivors from the original crew of the Ascendant Justice sabotaged its main drive conduit. Admiral Whitcomb in turn ordered the Spartans to go EVA to repair the conduit. They were transported to the repair site in a spirit dropship, and successfully repaired the damage despite an attempted ambush from Stealth Sanghealy and a wave of misplaced plasma fire. The Spirit's pilot, Warrant Officer Sheila Pulaski, and Spartans Anton 044 and Lee 008 were vaporized by the plasma. Will, Fred, John, and Grace 093 survived. With the Ascendant Justice's drive conduit repaired, the hybrid ship was able to escape from the distorted slipspace arena and found itself in a remote part of human explored space. The survivors urgently needed to return to UNSC High Command to inform them of one of Cortana's discoveries. The Covenant had located and were planning to invade the Earth. On the Master Chief's recommendation, they traveled to an old rebel outpost that the Spartans had visited once before, a place where they could ask for repairs. Despite some grandstanding from both sides, the resident insurrectionists agreed to help repair the UNSC's hybrid ship. After the arrival and narrow defeat of a Covenant cruiser, Admiral Whitcomb initially promised to evacuate and grant amnesty to the Rebels, but when an overwhelming number of Covenant reinforcements arrived, the Rebels ceased work on the Gettysburg Ascendant Justice to hunker down in their asteroid, and the UNSC forces fled through slipspace. By this time, Dr. Halsey had successfully resuscitated Lind 058, convinced the ODST survivor from Alpha Halo to destroy the slipspace crystal, and stolen a small, slipspace-capable ship from the Rebels, with which she kidnapped Kelly and departed for Onyx. The Master Chief, Will, and the other soldiers had also been busy reviewing their options to counter the impending Covenant invasion. Upon Sergeant Johnson's suggestion, the Spartans decided on a plan to infiltrate and destroy the Covenant's mustering station, the unyielding Hierophant. With the anomalous artifact out of the picture, the Master Chief pitched his plan to Admiral Whitcomb for Operation First Strike. Although initially unwilling to grant his request, he was eventually persuaded to let the Spartans go. They would transition from slipspace to normal space in an up-armored spirit dropship, with their sole objective being the destruction of the unyielding Hierophant and its gathering army. Despite the dropship's armor, all of the Spartans, including Will, were knocked unconscious during the transition. The chief was roused by the copy of Cortana that she had split off to go with him for first strike, and he subsequently woke the rest of them. Their spirit had suffered extreme, but not catastrophic damage from its journey out of slipspace. Due to the sheer scale of the Covenant assembly around the unyielding Hierophant, the duplicate Cortana was able to request transportation to a repair bay without raising suspicion. Once inside, Will and the other Spartans were led by the duplicate Cortana through a series of narrow maintenance pathways and spaces that were incidentally accessible, all in order to avoid detection. Because of the sheer immensity of the station and the largely covert nature of their movement, their journey from the repair bay to the station's nearest reactor complex took roughly 12 hours. Their original path was dead-ended by the 11-hour mark, requiring Cortana to give them a new, faster, more dangerous route to the reactor. They crossed a massive, beautifully ornamented space with various buildings, inverted waterfalls, headless birds, and banshee squadrons into a frigid temple where they were ambushed by Jirohana warriors. The Spartans barely escaped, except for Grace 093, who was killed by three impacts from a brute shot. They continued through the temple and took another maintenance tunnel downward into the reactor room, where the chief was able to interface Cortana directly with the controls. Upon his instruction, she overloaded one of the fusion reactors, causing the other reactors to follow suit. 
Blue Team escaped by taking an elevator and returning to the colossal room they had crossed earlier, then flying banshees conveniently emptied for them by Linda's sharpshooting. With some difficulty, they destroyed a reinforced window that separated them from the adjacent repair bay, which the duplicate Cortana had emptied of its atmosphere. The Spartans rendezvoused at an intact dropship and quietly retreated behind a local moon. The Gettysburg was waiting for them. Admiral Whitcomb and the Oni survivor from Alpha Halo, Lieutenant Elias Haverson, decided to belay their return to Earth in favor of luring as many Covenant ships toward their doomed command and control center as possible, using a holographic mimic of the Forerunner slipspace crystal as bait. Their plan worked, at the cost of their lives. Virtually all of the Covenant armada was obliterated by the unyielding Hierophant's nuclear catastrophe. The Spartans, along with Sergeant Avery Johnson, finally left the system after confirming that First Strike was indeed a success. Following the events of Operation First Strike, Linda and Fred reported to an ONI committee without Will-043, whose absence was not mentioned to the best of our knowledge. We know that he rejoined Blue Team for missions on and around the Earth during the Battle for the Planet in October and November of 2552. There are potential sightings of William inside New Mombasa prior to the Solemn Penance's slipspace jump, close to UNSC and Covenant fighting over the Forerunner artifact known as the Conduit. It is unknown if Will had intel on the Conduit, if that Spartan was him. Will's last assignment on Earth as part of Blue Team required them to secure the Centennial Orbital Elevator in Cuba. The Covenant had wiped out all human personnel at the facility and stationed two warships in local orbit. Blue Team was deployed via Pelican dropship in the nearby jungle and swiftly made its way to the elevator's cargo facility to assess its situation. They discovered Jirohana forces attempting to use the orbital elevator to deliver Fenris-class nuclear warheads to their warships above. The Brutes also had a Scarab on sight. While Linda engaged the enemy from afar, and Fred haphazardly attacked the Brutes in close quarters, William rushed an 18-wheel gasoline tanker into the Scarab's path. The Scarab stepped on the tanker, causing a detonation and catching itself on fire. The mechanized assault platform more or less melted. Fred and Linda mopped up the rest of the Brutes, and they met inside the rail car loaded with warheads. Blue Team used the car to ascend the elevator, speaking with Lord Hood on the way. He relayed a message from Cortana that had been piggybacked by Dr. Halsey. The Spartans listened to her automated distress on the new Halo threats and the Flood. John had been with her. There were no specific details other than the single mention of him on the Forerunner Dreadnought. Lord Hood had to be sending them as backup. But then Dr. Halsey's text message appeared explaining the discovery of new Forerunner technologies, and the possibility of capturing and using them to neutralize both Covenant and Flood threats. Their new objective was the Oni Black Site, Onyx, and to reach this distant world, they decided to hijack one of the Covenant destroyers in orbit. Two Spirit dropships delivered the 12 nukes from the ascending elevator car, six for each craft. William, Fred, and Linda sneaked onto the turret of one of the dropships, and were themselves delivered into the cargo bay of a destroyer. They killed the crew in the bay, and then depressurized all of the warship's compartments, neatly eliminating any resistance. On the bridge, Fred input a slipspace jump solution to the vessel's computer. They simultaneously transitioned to slipspace, and detonated the other six warheads. The Spartans found themselves with a brief respite. William put it to good use, catching up on some much-needed sleep. Their downtime ended just as quickly when their vessel, the Bloodied Spirit, was drawn out of slipstream space by a distress call from other Covenant warships. They were greeted by a brute shipmaster expecting reinforcements against a Sangheili-controlled heavy cruiser. The initial confusion quickly shifted into another battle. Linda and William worked together to protect their ship, with Linda employing her unparalleled marksmanship to neutralize enemy plasma fire with their vessel's own plasma turrets, and William engaging the ship's repulsors to back away as fast as possible. Despite their combined efforts, a bolt of plasma reached them and inflicted serious damage. Fred ordered William to activate their slipspace drive before its power levels had a chance to plummet, and despite being at less than 100% capacity, Covenant Engineering successfully delivered them into slipspace. 
They emerged back into normal space, a mere stone's throw away from Onyx. The bloodied spirit continued to burn from the plasma damage, and to compound this problem, a new enemy appeared. The sentinels that constituted the body and defense force of Onyx engaged their ship. These unique, modular sentinels combined to multiply their damage output, and burned another hull through the Covenant ship. However, between Blue Team's arrival and their fight with the Sentinels, they picked up an automated UNSC message containing surface coordinates. On Fred's orders, Linda and Will put the ship on a collision course directly with those coordinates. Once the destroyer entered Onyx's atmosphere, they abandoned the doomed vessel in a dropship and landed more or less safely in the nearby jungle. Almost immediately, they encountered Kelly, the Spartan Threes, and a brother they believed to have long been lost. Kurt 051. There had been no happy reunion with Blue Team, no time for explanations, not even a handshake. All there had been time for was running. The Sentinel Patrol had been on them the instant they'd recovered the Spartans, an hour of non-stop cat and mouse through the jungle. The drones were getting very good at hunting them. The Spartans managed to evade the Sentinels long enough to devise a plan. Blue Team also reunited with Dr. Halsey and Franklin Mendez, the drill instructor who had helped forge them from young children into unparalleled soldiers. The Spartans coordinated to lure a pair of drones underneath tons of collapsing rock and snipe the drone on Overwatch. The plan was a success, with no casualties. Now with an opportunity to take the offensive, Lieutenant Commander Kurt now known as Kurt Ambrose since his recruitment into the Spartan 3 program, ordered his forces to move into Zone 67, a region that appeared to be ground zero of the Sentinel incursion. They used Blue Team's dropship to enter it. They encountered thousands of a configuration of Sentinel used for excavation, and the excavation site, which contained something foreign and awe-inspiring. There were pillars and arches, elevated aqueducts, columned temples with crowns of three-dimensional forerunner symbols, a forest of sculpted geometries of spheres, cubes, and tori, roads that curved up and twisted into Mobius surfaces. It was a vast, alien city. Pressing forward, they landed their dropship on a domed structure and investigated a staircase that twisted around the column on which the dome sat. William followed it to a room with reactive Forerunner holograms. Dr. Halsey was able to discern enough of their meaning to find another doorway. They were led to a map room, which she used to discover the true nature of Onyx as an artificial planet, a shield world. She also discovered the whereabouts of a missing Spartan 3 team, and the arrival of a Covenant armada. They had used the Bloodied Spirit's slipspace coordinates to find Blue Team's destination. Perhaps most importantly, she also discovered an aperture that led from Onyx's exterior shell to the hidden Dyson Sphere within. But it was the AI Endless Summer who showed them the factory that produced Onyx's unique Sentinels. They used the installation's translocation system to reach and destroy the Sentinel factory, then rescued the slipspace pods that contained Spartan 3 Team Katana, and finally teleported to the room that housed the portal between the outer shell and the Dyson Sphere. The passage was closing, with around half an hour remaining to a seemingly final cutoff point. There was an actively lowering hill of concentric rings that surrounded the horizontal portal, and ten meter long fins that sat atop the hill. The Spartans, Mendez, and Dr. Halsey used this hill for cover against the Covenant invasion force. They would defend it at all costs, to deny the Covenant access to whatever lay beyond. They killed a wave of grunts, but were then faced with elite warriors wielding point defense gauntlets and hunter pairs. Despite the Spartans' best efforts, a group of three elites and two hunters survived long enough to reach the top of the hill. Kelly dispatched the elites, but the hunters managed to kill one of the Spartan threes, and one of them gravely wounded Kurt before Linda shot its vulnerable abdomen. William, in a heroic gesture, hurled himself at the hunter and knocked the beast off its feet and into its mate, and the three of them tumbled down the stairs. Will stood between both hunters at the base of the hill. He kicked the nearest in the unarmored middle, and it staggered back. There were elites watching in sheer awe, and then kept at a distance by suppression fire from Lucy, B091, and Kurt. 
One hunter lashed out with its shield. Will ducked, darted inside its reach, and battered its bruised midsection, punching through flesh and ripping out wriggling chunks of the composite eel colony. The other hunter, however, used its fuel rod cannon against Will. His energy shield vanished, and the front of his Mjolnir armor melted. He took a step toward the beast and collapsed. Fred returned the favor by destroying the remaining hunter with a rocket, but William was dead. Kelly retrieved his body on Kurt's orders, and it was ultimately sent through the portal to the Dyson Sphere. Blue Team, the remaining Spartan Threes, Dr. Halsey, and Mendez followed him through. They buried him in an oak tree grove by a flowing river, and used a slab of onyx for his gravestone. His name was etched into the stone. Kurt stayed behind and used two Fenris warheads to obliterate the Covenant forces, thus ending their journey to claim Forerunner treasures. William's comrades, his brothers and sisters, were safe. Joshua and William were both valiant, seasoned Spartans, and for Will we have an assessment from the Master Chief. Will was quiet, but had never failed to complete his mission. He wasn't always that way, though. When he was younger, he was the one with the jokes and riddles that kept the team's spirits high. Something had hardened in him over the years, as it had in them all. But with Will, something special had been lost. Whether or not that quality was truly lost, traces of it remained, not only in John's memory, but also in the final months of William's service. He joked about Linda. That's why she likes to snipe. I caught her snoring last time she posted in that tower on Europa, and affectionately named the cluster of armed Fenris warheads, taken from the Centennial Orbital Elevator, a little slice of Armageddon. And I, having said William so often throughout the course of this biography, should apologize to him because he had never liked his formal name, but his life was nothing short of amazing. While information is more scarce concerning Joshua, there are things about his character in particular that I think can be discerned. He was judicious, and perhaps a little more conciliatory than his peers. When John 117 was allowing his doubts to get the better of him before their first boarding up in 2526, Joshua offered a counterpoint. Their lack of information on their enemy gave them the edge of caution whereas their enemy may have been overconfident, underestimating humanity's real capabilities. His incisiveness was allied with a lack of self-importance. Spartans have subtle ways of expressing disappointment, usually in their tone of voice, body language, or time to acknowledge an order. But there are few, if any, recorded instances of Joshua letting it show. He was ready to help as needed, even if that meant joining a planet-side operation instead of a more daring space op, or escorting civilians out of danger. There are many examples to which we can point of the inspiration that Spartans have given to soldiers and civilians alike, when Joshua and his team rescued those civilians, including the injured, from Cote d'Azur. He may well have inspired them, and influenced the future in ways that are waiting to be revealed.